also during the breaks, we're going to be using our, our gather town space so that we can have video conversations with you guys. Um, so the links to gather town will be showing up at the end of these sessions. So all without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sean Hill, who's going to be telling us about neuroinformatics cross scales and, and the goals of this goals of this session. Um, and he's our former, our, our big man, our great leader uh, of the Kremble Center of Neuroinformatics, our director. Um, and without the owl, we'll let him take the stage. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I wanted to, to be sure just to thank Erin. She's done an amazing job of, of all the work to, to get this course set up and organized and running smoothly. And, and it's fantastic. Thank you, Erin. And also to all the faculty and teaching assistants. Um, really, really looking forward to an amazing week. I think that you're going to find this course is quite unique and it's and it's going to be um, well, actually longer than a week, right? So it's, it's going to be an amazing uh, session and opportunity to, to learn really a lot of different levels across the brain. Um, so really excited and, and very eager also to hear your feedback on the course and how it goes for you and things that we can improve for future uh, courses because we do um, we do this each year and we're going to keep learning from, from each experience. So um, thank you all for joining us. All right, I'm going to now try to share my, my presentation. And hopefully everybody can see this. Is it working? Yes, I see it. Great. All right, and then I just have to navigate my my arrow back to the other screen. <laughs> there we go. All right, so this morning, um, I really want to talk to you about kind of a multi-scale perspective uh, and an, an approach to understanding brain disorders and some common principles that we see across brain disorders. Uh, so first of all, just to introduce, um, we are embedded, so the, the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics is embedded within the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. It's Canada's largest mental health and addictions teaching hospital. We're here in Toronto, Canada. And uh, CAMH sees quite a variety of patients. There are over a million visits per year, over 30,000 unique patients and uh, a, a broad range of diagnoses. So we have patients with uh, substance use disorders, with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, and with mood disorders. And of course, a lot of that can be concurrent and comorbid. And, um, and so that, that's really a, a tremendous diversity, as well as the, the diversity of um, the population in the greater Toronto area and, and Ontario uh, is, really represents um, you know, incredible population um, that we're that we're working to address, and the 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 Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics was established around a number of core pillars and and uh, challenges. One is around multi-scale data. How do we organize and integrate uh, multi-scale data um, in order to so, in, for example, genetics, imaging, mobile device data, and so on. Um, and, it, and that's really to facilitate applying tools like artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, and so on to improve our ability to recognize patterns, to, to support the, the definition, diagnosis, and prediction of mental illnesses, um, and as well to inform multi-scale brain models. And you're going to be learning quite a bit about that throughout this course that really help us identify the cellular and synaptic mechanisms um, of brain function and dysfunction. Some of our core principles and, uh, are really around open science, uh, team science, global collaboration. This is really important to us that we're, we're really, and you're gonna learn a bit about the FAIR data principles this afternoon, but collaboration is really central to, um, to our purpose and to, to the way that we've, we've built the center. Um, 
And as you can see, education is also very important to our mission, very central, and this summer school is one of our activities. We do have quite a number of ongoing workshops and hackathons and, um, and, and other training events throughout the year, but the, the Kremble Center uh, summer school is really a key activity for us. And then we're also serving as a responsible incubator for technologies, ethical, responsible incubation. To Basically, we want to accelerate the translation of algorithms, of devices, of technologies um, that are developed within the center to the clinic. And that's, that's really essential. Um, we work collaboratively, really, with clinicians, with the technology providers, with of course, the, the modelers, the data infrastructure of the hospital, all with an eye of how can we best improve care for the individual patient. Um, and so this is a process that is not a single iteration. It's something that requires ongoing collaboration, iteration, and engagement, not only with clinicians, but also with patients um, and, and family members and other caregivers in understanding how can we best improve their experience and their care um, in, in this process. And of course, one of the key challenges in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders is that there are many potential mechanisms across different scales of the brain, from the genetics, to the transcriptomics, to the prote proteomics, to the cells and circuits and synapses, to the, to the uh, whole brain and cognitive networks and behavior. And, and fundamentally in the clinic today, uh, disorders are, are diagnosed based on a symptomology. And um, so it's sets of symptoms that help us diagnose a particular disorder. And that is not necessarily very specific and differentiating and that's one of the, the core challenges. And, and in addition, we, we really fundamentally want to get to a level where we can move in, in this sense, this is the RDOC um, framework from uh, Tom Insel and, and Bruce Cuthbert, where they talked about moving away from the symptom-based categories of, of mental illnesses to uh, using integrated data to help us drive kind of a data-driven definition of, of disorders that can help us fundamentally um, categorize disorders based on the underlying mechanisms, biological mechanisms. And that's, of course, a grand challenge for psychiatry. And another kind of grand challenge is, is the fact that we've got such diverse types of data. So there's so many different types of data from the subcellular level to the cellular level to the tissue level to whole brain and behavior. And of course, um, uh, they're produced from many different experimental methods, many different modalities, many different instruments. And there's a grand challenge of how do you organize that? How do you make it possible to integrate all of that to build a, a, a more integrated understanding of how these levels of the brain relate to each other and can inform, for example, definitions of mental health disorders. And of course, organizing and integrating data from the clinic as well um, is, is necessary to accelerate bridging between the clinic and the basic neuroscience and giving us a more integral picture of each individual um, and their care. So one of our ambitions in the center is, is really to establish um, uh, essentially a, a brain health atlas that would integrate data from gen the genomics level, the molecular level, clinical, neuroimaging, mobile and wearables and populations, but transdiagnostically, so across different disorders um, so that we can use this data to really inform uh, the modeling efforts and the, and the machine learning models. And you'll, you'll learn more about this in the context of the CAMH Brain Health Data Bank, which is our, our kind of flagship efforts to collect this data, high quality longitudinal data to support care, integrating research measures with care, and then accumulating a large amount of data. And that will be, you'll learn about that later in the week. 
And one of the key ways in which we, we get that engagement with the clinic is to build decision support tools for clinicians so that they can see at a glance the trajectory of an individual patient over time. For example, what, how is their depression severity and what are some of the, the risks? What's the current medication? What are some of the, the additional side effects possibly of medication in terms of weight change um, and, and so on? And, and this gives us a way to, to kind of speak a common language with clinicians and to deploy um, any algorithms and computational models to the clinician so that they have value from the work that we do in the center. So today I wanted just to take you through a number of common principles, a common observations um, across many, many different disorders, including neurologic disorders, psychiatric disorders, and substance abuse disorders. And that's that virtually all of these disorders are associated with changes in brain connectivity. And that, it, basically, if you go through the literature, you see there's always some kind of mention about changes in interactions and connectivity, either functional or structural, between brain areas in these disorders. At the same time, uh, the literature also is full of descriptions of changes in brain excitability in virtually every single one of these disorders. And we'll talk a bit later about what brain excitability and changes in brain excitability might mean. Um, but it's another observation that's very, very common across virtually all disorders. And, um, at the same time, there's disorders are associated with disruptions in sleep. So we've got connectivity, excitability, sleep, as well as brain energy metabolism, and as well as immune response. And so these are some very common principles. And, and the big question is, is why? What is the relationship between all of these different disorders and these common observations of changes in, in uh, cognition, behavior, sleep, brain energy metabolism, immune response, brain connectivity, and brain excitability. Um, and so that's part of what I'll, I'll take you through today is at least one perspective on how the, these elements can relate. And, the, and this week will really take you on a, a more specific voyage across different levels looking at many of these aspects. And so first of all, just to look at the effect of changes in excitability, just at the most minute level on a, on a cortical microcircuit and the response to a stimuli. Um, first of all, just wanted to point out that there is an observation, this is work from uh, Professor Etienne Sibyl, who's also here at, at CAMH, um, who's done a lot of work uh, relating and, and, and observing that um, there are changes in the expression of somatostatin and specifically um, related to somatostatin positive interneurons in major depressive disorder. And this is, the, the somatostatin positive interneurons are really a key um, interneuron within the cortical microcircuitry that provides inhibition onto the dendritic tufts of the pyramidal cell. And um, so that just this, this observation that there is this alteration in major depressive disorder, but also across many different disorders. So um, there's reduced uh, somatostatin GABAergic neuron markers across Parkinson's disease. It's downregulated basically in every single one of these neurological disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, major depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder all show is kind of in, in varying ways, either in terms of decreased neuron number and density or decreased expression of somatostatin. And so this is very interesting. Well, what does that mean? How do, how do changes in excitability, say if you, if you alter the inhibition in the local microcircuitry, um, or change the balance of excitation and inhibition within the local microcircuitry, as would be happening here with reduced 
uh, inhibitory effects, how would that translate into some kind of a meaningful change in the response of a cortical circuit um, to input? And so the way that uh, we tackle that is really through something called integrative multi-scale modeling. And there are many different forms of this, but, the, but the, at its core, um, the challenge really involves first kind of organizing your data, um, building models, building ways in which you can apply math, basically parameterize and optimize mathematical models according to your data, then use those mathematical models to, to run simulations um, and simulated experiments to test your hypotheses, and then also to validate the models and refine. So this is an iterative process where you basically, you know you're not going to in the first pass build the perfect model, but you, through a process of iterative building, uh, uh, validating and refinement, uh, you keep incrementally integrating more data and building multi-scale models. And I'll take you through an example of that this morning. So the example I'll take you through first is really from the, the Blue Brain Project where I worked for about a decade. Um, and the challenge there was to integrate multi-scale data on ne neocortical microcircuitry coming from a uh, rat, somatosensory cortex. So this is a, a juvenile rat postnatal day approximately 14 um, in the somatosensory area. Um, and it was really from about 20,000 experiments, a lot of data from the lab, including electrophysiological re recordings using whole cell patch clamp of the, the voltage response of individual neurons, um, the, the filling these neurons with a dye to see their three-dimensional morphology um, and reconstruct the shape of the neurons, pulling out the cytoplasm of the cells to, to do um, basically RT-PCR at the time uh, to analyze the gene expression products in each cell type, um, doing paired recordings between cells to look at the synaptic communication between them, and overall building up a, a profile, many different profiles of this one single little circuit that's about half a millimeter wide and a millimeter and a half tall to understand what are the different cell types within it, um, how, how are they distributed, how do they connect to each other, um, and so on. And then the question is, once you've gathered that data, what do you do with that? How do you actually use that to, to get gain deeper insight into the microcircuitry? And so the approach that we took was, was really to, to take the building blocks of this circuit. And these are, these are examples of the neuron morphologies that have been reconstructed from different layers of cortex within, within this microcircuit. So layer one, layer two, three, layer four, five, and six. On the left, you have the interneurons and the diversity of the different types of inhibitory interneurons. Whereas on the, on the left, sorry, I should say on the left, that's where the interneurons are. On the right is where you've got the pyramidal cells. These are the excitatory cells as the, as the, and examples of them occurring uh, throughout the different layers. And then we used a data-driven digital reconstruction process to build a microcircuit by placing those different building blocks, those three-dimensional neuron morphologies according to the statistics into the volume of the of the microcircuit and here you can see just the inside of the circuit as the cells are being placed and part of what this is doing is building a physical scaffold um, in three dimensions of where, how the how these different neuron types can actually form potential synaptic connectivity uh, between the cells and so this biophysical basis allowed us then to explore a, a, quite a number of different principles and properties of how to recreate the biological connectivity from this scaffold. And uh, this, there's a series of publications that really take you through the, the steps of establishing the connectivity, first by looking at which dendrites and axons come into, come close to each other, so are, 
our uh, form appositions, and then using some rules to prune down from the structural context, the potential context, to match the, the functional number, mean number of synapses per connection, and to also layer in then the overall observed Bhutan density of the functional connect connections from the biology, and using all of that to prune down the connectivity to match best, the, in the best way possible, the observed functional distribution of synapses. And then to simulate the electrical behavior of the neurons, we modeled the ion channels and, the, and using the Rall equations, um, modeled the, the passive cable equations. Um, and so the Hodgkin-Huxley equations are really the classical formulism for how ion channels open and close. Um, but one of the challenges is that there are um, a lot of different ion channels in the brain and uh, about 200 of them are voltage activated. And so when you see an individual um, action potential in the brain, it's actually being generated. So in this case, in the, in the center, you see a voltage trace where a current is being injected into the, the soma of a cell and you see an elicited action potential. Well, there's an orchestra of ion channels that are all contributing to the generation of that response. And so this diversity of ion channels and which ones are active when in, in terms of generating the, the excitability of the individual neurons is a great challenge. And so we, one of the additional challenges is that in general, when you go to the literature, it's very, very difficult to get good characterizations of ion channels. We were able to, for these 12 primary classes of ion channels, find, to, to find them and to build models that were consistent in terms of temperature and species and so on. But in general, it's very, very difficult to get uh, complete characterizations of ion channels under controlled conditions. And so that led, um, in the context of the Blue Brain Project, us to launch Channelpedia. So uh, if you go to channelpedia.upfl.ch, there's an online database um, of data and information about ion channels. And part of this effort was to, to clone ion channels, starting from the DNA sequence of the ion channels, clone them and express them within Chinese hamster ovarian cells, and then use patch clamp robots to automatically characterize their voltage response and to, to build Hodgkin-Huxley style models from very temperature controlled, solution controlled, and, and because these Chinese hamster ovarian cells, these Cho cells, don't express other voltage gated channels, you really get a very clean signal in terms of the, the characterization of the activation and inactivation kinetics of each ion channel as well as all the temperature control. And so this gave us a way to generate a lot of data um, in a very controlled way for ion channels. And then the challenge is, is well, how do you build a model neuron? And you'll learn more about this later in, in the week as well. Um, to, taking the three-dimensional uh, morphologies, using information about from gene expression, about which ion channels are present in those cells, using the, the ion channel models, and then uh, essentially applying a multi-objective optimization process. So it's a machine learning process to tr try out different configurations of the ion channels distributed across that morphology to recreate the electrical features of each electrical type of neuron. And using this approach, um, you can really establish an automated workflow to build data-driven model neurons. And, and so before this approach was developed, it really took you know, three years for an individual PhD student to build a model neuron. Um, now we can automatically generate hundreds of thousands of model neurons that, can, that adhere to and are, are formed by the data uh, recorded from biological experiments so that, that can be, um, then they can be tested uh, qual you know, quality assurance, generalization to other types of stimuli, and so on automatically. And this is an example of one of those neurons from Itai Hai, who you'll, is, is a faculty in the center, um, and beautiful layer five pyramidal cell with active dendrites and, and uh, soma 
and integrating synaptic input um, basically through, throughout the, the dendritic arbor. Um, and so this approach was used to recreate the 207 morphoelectric types. So that's 55 morphological types, 11 electrical types, and the combinations that exist and, and occur uh, results in 207 morphoelectric types of neuron. And as well, the synaptic, short-term synaptic plasticity, um, really taking into account the fact that each synaptic connection actually has, is very dynamic. It's not that these connection strengths are static and remain the same the whole time. They, um, for certain types of connections, uh, some pathways are facilitating where the connection strength will get stronger with each presynaptic pre spike. Others will become weaker. Um, so, sorry, for depressing, they'll become weaker. For facilitating, they'll become stronger. And you have these for both inhibitory and excitatory cells, as well as in the pseudolinear response, where there's, there's not as dramatic of a change in the synaptic strength. Um, and, the, and so mapping those out and then bringing those into the different synaptic pathways really is key to capturing a very fundamental part of the synaptic dynamics, the short-term synaptic plasticity. And when you put all of that together, this, this model microcircuit, if you, if you simulate kind of a general depolarization by changing the ex extracellular potassium concentration, what happens is it starts to give rise to these low frequency oscillations. And these low frequency oscillations resemble very much um, the sorts of activity that are seen in isolated slice um, with, with a particular uh, bath solution or um, things resembling as well uh, isolated cortical slabs where the, these up and down states uh, re resemble what happens in deep non-REM sleep. And so this is kind of known to be a default state of the isolated cortex to generate these low frequency uh, rhythms um, and just intrinsically from its own uh, intrinsic cellular properties. And, and one of those mechanisms that we'll talk about later is really these, these layer five uh, bursting cells that, that trigger this. From this, we built a model virtual brain slice, and this gives us then a tool to validate, to run computer simulations and simulated experiments that have been done in the biology in a, in a, in, in a brain slice and to do further validation. One of the other developments was because we are modeling the three-dimensional morphology of the neurons, and we know the location and the density of all the different ion channels and the current sources, we can use a line source approximation to calculate an extracellular potential for each individual neuron. And you can see some examples here of a layer four pyramidal neuron and, and what that potential looks like in the space around the neuron. But then if you add all of these up from all of the different cells within the circuit, you can actually approximate the local field potential generated by this population of neurons. And so this is an example there where we're showing a subset of neurons from a, a, a larger microcircuit. And then the colors are showing the volumetric rendering of the local field potential computed for that volume from the all the ion channels and synaptic connections and uh, somatic firing properties within the circuit. And so this gives us a way then to relate the waveforms that you would measure by putting an electrode into neural tissue, where you see, or or from the surface of the skull, where you see an EEG, so either local field potential or or if you add some additional filters, the, the EEG. And that gives us a tool then to relate, what do those waveforms actually look like at the level of individual cells and synapses? And so that's an important way of bridging scales between uh, in the model aid. So one of the... Um, interesting things was that because we're building 
the model from really in a data-driven way, from in vitro data. Typically, and in fact, all of the in vitro data that we have is done under a particular calcium concentration, extracellular calcium at two millimolars. And that's because it facilitates identifying synaptic connections and getting good signals and so on. But um, in vivo, we know that there's a much lower level of uh, cal extracellular calcium. And when we went through the literature and did some additional experiments to see, well, how did the synaptic, the short-term synaptic plasticity dynamics change when you change that extracellular calcium? We saw something important that actually the extracellular calcium affects the excitatory synapses much more than the inhibitory. So by changing the extracellular calcium, lowering the extracellular calcium from two millimolar to 1.3 millimolar, you're actually changing the balance of excitation and inhibition, the relative ratio of excitation and inhibition. And when we put that into the model, we saw that we no longer had the, the big oscillations, these, these kind of up-down states, these, these, this low-frequency oscillation, we saw that we moved the circuit into a state where there was asynchronous activity with, with occasional transient waves that, that went through, but it was a very, very different dynamic of activity. And so that showed us that one, by changing one biophysical parameter, extracellular calcium, could radically change the network dynamics. And when we map that out uh, in this parameter search, so each of these boxes is a, is a set of simulations, is a simulation of the circuit under a particular condition of uh, extracellular calcium along the x-axis, decreasing from two millimolar to 1.2 millimolar. And then along the y-axis um, is it increasing depolarization levels, such as changing extracellular potassium. And in the box in, in red, you can see, you know, in between this low frequency oscillation band on the left and the silent or, or very low levels of activity on the right, you see this asynchronous level of activity. And, um, and it's a fairly abrupt transition between asynchronous and synchronous level activity. And then of course, at the lowest bar, you see very ep epileptic-like activity. So it's really getting hyper excitable. We did some experimental validation of this, um, both taking the in silico results from two millimolar calcium and one millimolar calcium and comparing them to the in vitro. And we saw very much the same transition between a synchronous and asynchronous state for the cortical microcircuit. And so this change in excitability um, essentially manipulating that, that relative ratio between uh, excitation and inhibition um, can change, it can create kind of a hyper-excitable sleep-like response in, in one way. And then when we reduce the calcium level, we can bring it to a normal excitability as in the, the awake state and really resembles um, wakefulness-like responses to stimuli so the x-axis here is showing different levels of thalamic input to the cortex in, in the model. And in the sleep-like condition, or, or the very hyper-excitable level, um, once you get to eight stimulated fibers, you trigger this, this widespread all-or-nothing response, this traveling wave. Um, whereas if you're looking at the bottom normal excitability, you get a very proportional response to the input. So it's really reflecting the characteristics of the input very directly. Um, and so fundamentally, the, the computation, the transform that the circuit performs is fundamentally different under these conditions, uh, different conditions of extracellular calcium. So with that, I just wanted to emphasize for this period, the, for, for this uh, portion of the talk, this reconstruction was really built entirely from laboratory data measurements. It wasn't tuned to produce specific um, network level behavior, but it gave rise to them um, in, in a way that was constrained by the data and gave us insight into the ways in which the, 
the computation performed by the circuit, the transform um, of input by the circuit, you know, really gives us insight that is greater um, than just looking at the parts alone. So it really gives an emergent network level behavior. So another piece of this um, is that changing the excitability actually affects the ability to discriminate um, different stimuli and different size stimuli. So this balance, this very precise balance of excitation and inhibition um, really determines the degree to which you can precisely discriminate against different stimuli. And I don't have time to go through that in depth, but that's an important uh, characteristic that maintaining that balance is really key to the very uh, precise ability to discriminate different types of input. So with that, the Blue Brain um, project, this, this is uh, 82 co-authors on that paper, a very, very large team effort, absolutely uh, tremendous contributions across um, a broad group of, of collaborators. And so here I wanted to, to then look at, well, how can changes in excitability actually govern changes between wakefulness and sleep? And so first of all, one of the things that we know is that there are different modulations throughout the course of the day of excitability. So first of all, you've got a circadian cycle, which, which you, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, I think you're all familiar with, you know, typically modulated by light, by the presence of the circadian day, uh, you, get a, you get a growing signal um, throughout, throughout the course of the day that keeps you aroused and then tapers off and, and um, when, it's, when it's down scaled, down regulated, you've got sleep. But there's another process governing your sleep-wake cycle, which is the homeostatic sleep drive. So the longer you're awake, this, there's sleep pressure builds up and it's only relieved by getting enough sleep um, to reduce that sleep pressure. And that there's a homeostatic response uh, in terms of you know, throughout the course of the night, the, uh, your sleep pressure basically progressively decreases as you get, for example, slow wave sleep to relieve that sleep, sleep pressure. And in fact, slow wave activity during sleep is seen to be a key homeostatic part of the sleep process and restoring and reducing sleep pressure. Um, and in the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis from Giulio Tononi and Chiara Torelli, um, they really relate that sleep pressure and, and this need for sleep to uh, a potentiation of synapses during the period that you're awake. So that by, they predict that the, by the end of the day, you've got high synaptic density, high synaptic strength, and that it's only through sleep that you get the synaptic homeostasis, which also results in, in memory consolidation and decreases the synaptic density and strength. And that this cycle of essentially the period of wakefulness leading to increased synaptic strength, slow wave sleep resulting in synaptic downscaling, resulting in um, reduced slow waves and then retur returning you to a baseline, um, they've built up quite a body of evidence to support this hypothesis, including EM level reconstructions of synaptic spines and seeing the number of spines uh, decreasing after sleep. So there's, there's a very interesting hypothesis there that helps uh, relate, for example, the synaptic, sort of the, the observed homeostasis of sleep and the buildup of sleep pressure to cellular and synaptic mechanisms. Now, when we look at the actual level of activity within the brain, um, so at the bottom you see intracellular recordings from cortex, um, then there's an EMG and, a, and um, in intracellular level of, of a cortical cell. At the top you see the EEG. Uh, in a cat, while the brain is transitioning, while the animal is transitioning from wakefulness to slow wave sleep. And if you look at the bottom, you see really the key difference between wakefulness 
and slow wave sleep, which is that the, the kind of tonic irregular firing of wakefulness, when you're asleep, it's actually interrupted by these hyperpolarized silent periods, um, which really are called down states and which interrupt that depolarized phase. And it's this alternation between these depolarized periods or up states and hyperpolarized periods called down states that generates this low frequency oscillation that is seen in the EEG. And so you see this low frequency, high amplitude activity in the EEG during a slow wave sleep and low amplitude, um, high frequency activity in during wake. And so what's happening during all of this? Well, neuromodulatory influences are really responsible for keeping us awake. There are these wake on networks and, and virtually, you know, coming from the hypothalamus, from the midbrain reticular formation, so on, they are driving thalamus and cortex with some key neuromodulators, these neurotransmitters, hypocretin, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, and acetylcholine, which are really responsible for creating this sustained wakefulness period. And when you go to sleep, what's happening is it's actually there's a removal of these neuromodulators. So these areas that are typically driving your wakefulness period, they stop firing or they fire differently um, during, during sleep. And that changes the influence and the release of these neurotransmitters and neuromodulators on the thalamus and the cortex. And so that removal of these neurotransmitters during sleep is what underlies this, this non-REM sleep period. Another Im interesting observation is that during wakefulness, cortex is really driven by thalamic input. So it's, um, if you remove the thalamus, and these two studies, um, two distinct studies, basically silence the thalamus in awake uh, mice, and they saw that within 10 milliseconds of silencing the thalamus, the corresponding area of cortex um, basically goes silent. And so they could, they could see that um, during wakefulness, without that thalamic drive, there's no activity in cortex. It's really silent. Um, however, if, you're, if the animal is asleep or anesthetized, the cortex actually starts to generate these low frequency oscillations, it starts to generate sleep rhythms all on its own. It doesn't require thalamic input to generate activity. And so what, what's striking is in one condition during wakefulness, basically you're, the cortex is really being driven by sensory input. In the other, it's a dialogue within itself. It's talking, it's basically generating this activity within cortex and, and expressing that through the connectivity to generate activity. And so thinking a little bit about the, the cellular basis of this corticothalamo cortical loop, um, this is from a, a really beautiful recent review from uh, Gordon Shepard um, in Chicago um, that looked at these whole brain reconstructions of the excitatory projection neurons in the cortical thalamical, thalamical cortical loop. And you see how widespread uh, the axons are for individual neurons and how, how you know, tremendous these projections can be. So it's clearly a major impact um, of even individual level cells throughout the brain. And the work of um, Murray Sherman and Ray Guillory um, really established a, a model um, that proposes that d different areas, so if you start off from the sensory area, um, you've got a th thalamus and reticular nucleus. The reticular nucleus is providing this inhibitory influence to the thalamus, and then you've got multiple layers of cortex, and that kind of forms one thalamocortical loop. And it's really the, the output of that primary, of these primary or sensory 
thalamocortical loops that drive the higher order thalamocortical loops. And, um, and so their idea is that you're building up by, by efferent copies, these motor actions through this hierarchy of thalamocortical and transthalamic cortical communication. So this idea that cortex is just talking to itself through cortical cortical interactions um, is kind of augmented by a strong, strong role for driving interactions between the output of one cortical area to the thalamus of the next cortical area, to the um, next area in, in the hierarchy. And so we built um, a computer model of this model of, of Guillory and Sherman using a you know, basic architecture of the CAT visual thalamocortical system uh, where there's the visual input coming into a, a thalamus, reticular nucleus, three layers of cortex. And then uh, in addition to the corticocortical communication uh, between a secondary area, VS, there's also this output from the primary area, from layer five, six of the primary area to drive the thalamus in the secondary area. And um, this model really has about 65,000 model neurons, about 5 million connections. This is quite an old model at this point, um, but it also simulated the, the impact of neuromodulatory projections. So just for reference, the microcircuit that I showed earlier is about this size of the, the, the thalamocortical model that I'm showing here is more coarse grained and, and showing a larger area. Um, so briefly, the, the neuro, this, this model is built out of integrate and fire spiking neurons. There are intrinsic currents, Hodgkin Huxley style um, ion channel currents that, that endow the neurons with specific intrinsic properties. For example, the layer five cells having bursting properties. There's fast and, sh and short excitation and inhibition. So AMPA, NMDA, GABA A, GABA B, short term depression. And it's all based on, as I mentioned, on the patterned connectivity observed in the cat visual thalamocortical system. And so here we can see uh, some of the simulations just of the spontaneous activity driven by, really driven by the, uh, the sensory input. Then there's an evoked response to a, a moving grading, a slowly drifting moving grading. Then the offset response, and you see in the spontaneous activity a trace of that stimulus. And so here we see that the model, this thalamocortical recapitulates a lot of the properties of a wakefulness state. There's spontaneous ongoing activity. The spontaneous activity reflects the structure, the functional structure of the response properties. Um, there's irregular activity in the inter in, of the excitatory cells and higher level uh, irregular activity in, in the inhibitory interneurons. There's a low amplitude, high frequency local field potential. Um, and then when you present a stimulus, this moving grading stimulus, you actually get an evoked high, you know, strong onset response. You get that oscillation is actually a gamma frequency oscillation that emerges from the, from the model. And, and then a strong offset response where you, the inhibition, the built up inhibition and adaptation currents provide, pr produce this um, hyperpolarized period after, after the stimulation. And so this model then kind of gives a, you know, kind of a characterization of how by being driven purely by sensory uh, firing or firing from, for example, the optic nerve, just random firing and then structured um, firing, you've got the thalamus, reticular nucleus, and then different layers of the vertically selective population. And then the furthest population to the right is the horizontally selective population, you can see differences just in the spontaneous activity to, of these different populations. And that's consistent with observations um, on, on correlational structure and selectivity properties in the spontaneous activity. And here we apply, a, we provide a PLAB stimulus and you can see the feature selectivity where the model actually selects for the vertically selective population, pulls out just the vertical component of the stimulus at the thalamus, and the horizontally selective cells are responding just to the, the horizontal component of the plaid, whereas you can see that kind of both are being responded to in the reticular nucleus. So this, this really 
functionally recreates many, many observed uh, electrophysiological properties um, of wakefulness in thalamocortical circuitry. But then it, to transition to sleep, um, we, we want to simulate the removal of these wake-promoting neuromodulators. So for example, acetylcholine um, actually reduces the conductance. It blocks the uh, background potassium leak. And so by, by transitioning to sleep, we're going to increase that uh, potassium leak conductance, which results in a hyperpolarization of the neurons, moving them further away from their firing threshold. We're also going to increase the AMPA receptor conductance because acetylcholine also kind of cuts that in half. So we're removing that, you nearly double the strength of the excitatory connections. And as well, increasing the persistent sodium channel conductance. There are a few others, but these are, and it's not really systematically characterized what the effect of the neuromodulators are, but these are some of the key ones that actually change the state of the system at the, at the simulation level, at the cellular and synaptic level. And so here we show that simulation of, of taking the wakefulness state, gradually removing these neuromodulators or simulating the effect of the removal, where the cells then become hyperpolarized from the potassium leak, and then do the spontaneous activity within the bursting cells that triggers essentially an upstate where there's, there's mini columns that are essentially firing those get synchronized from the cortical connectivity to produce uh, essentially the whole population firing in an upstate together. And then they, through synaptic depression and through, um, through the buildup of adaptation currents, the network falls out of that upstate and produces essentially the slow wave oscillation, the slow wave activity. Um, that is observed during deep non-REM sleep. And so this is then exactly the same circuitry as before um, that produces the selective response during wakefulness, that produces the spontaneous activity, that produces the gamma frequency oscillations during wakefulness. But once you change these parameters, simulating the removal of neuromodulators, it produces the low frequency oscillation of slow wave sleep. Um, just quickly show here, you can see at the uh, kind of at the mini column level, you see these upstates, these periods of firing. They gradually synchronize across multiple different circuits, multiple different uh, mini columns, and then become silent um, all together, producing the cortically generated slow oscillation. And if you look at a stimulation during this slow oscillation, you can see that ap applying the plaid stimulus you no longer get a very clearly defined, um, it, you really get a very noisy response actually to the stimulation. You don't get a clear separation of features um, as before. You get a difference in the response and the orientation selectivity, but the, but the precision is overwhelmed by the noise generated by the upstate. And so one of the things I wanted to look at as well is how is, um, sleep homeostatically regulated and associated with synaptic plasticity as we know that that can be a, a key factor. So what, one study um, from Reto Huber and Giulio Tononi um, used a, a task, a very specific, um, basically rotation, a visual motor task of an individual moving a cursor to hit a target, but then the computer introduces a rotation that the, that the person is not aware of, and so they have to adapt. They basically unconsciously have to adapt to that rotation in the movement of their cursor. And it turns out that that learning, that adaptation, um, really involves one specific area in terms of the right parietal uh, area that, that is deeply implicated in the plasticity necessary to learn that rotation. And at night, when those subjects, when those partic study participants went to sleep, they showed increased um, slow wave activity in the area over that brain area, over the right parietal uh, area where this map is known to be implicated for visual motor learning. And so the, the link then was established between 
learning a task and synaptic plasticity putatively, but learning and the in local increase in sleep. And if you immobilize the arm, you also have essentially a suppression then of slow, uh, or decrease of slow, slow wave activity at night. So if there's no potential learning because the arm is, is immobilized, you get less um, slow wave activity over that area. And the slow wave um, slopes and incidents decrease throughout the night. So there's a homeostatic response of the amplitude of these slow wave waves throughout the night. And um, this synchronization, this, this slow wave sleep, uh, really the synchronization of it across the brain depends on excitatory connectivity. And so in the computer model, we were able to show that these intra-aerial connections really strongly synchronize um, the sleep. So cutting them in the model desynchronizes the slow oscillation. And so the control condition on top versus the lesion condition on the bottom. And similarly, uh, inter-aerial connections also synchronize the slow oscillation. So we see excitatory synaptic connectivity really being important in synchronizing the slow oscillations across the space. But in addition, we saw that you, you get at the mini column level, these local sleep, this local sleep, that if you increase the synaptic connectivity, they all get grouped together and you get the larger amplitude slow wave sleeps and the e slow wave uh, activity in the EEG. Whereas if the synaptic strength is weaker, you get a much more mixed EEG signal and you've got potentially, you know, different circuits that are locally asleep, uh, but not well synchronized. And in addition, the work of Marcello Massimini has shown using TMS EEG, that there's a significant difference in the effective connectivity during sleep in humans. So stimulating in one location during wakefulness results in widespread differentiated activation of brain areas Whereas during non-REM sleep, stimulating the same area results in a large amplitude local response, but that, that does not spread in a differentiated way across different brain areas. So we see a clear link to the ability of the, the brain to communicate across different areas in sleep. And the computer model, as I apologize, these movies aren't, aren't working, but we use the same computer model that I've been showing you, the thalamocortical model, to show that it could recapitulate this observed change in effective connectivity. And it's really the alteration in the excitability and the down states that are interfering with the effective connectivity in, in the model. So um, how does sleep homeostatically regulate thalamocortical excitability. Um, interestingly, with cortical excitability, um, you, see, you see this increase in cortical excitability with time awake and after sleep, it decreases. So these slow waves and their amplitude um, really change with sleep deprivation and after having sleep, it's restored. And so this is clearly a marker for altered excitability. So the slow, the slope of the slow waves and their amplitude is quite informative. The amplitude is more about the synchronization, but the slope is really indicative of the recruitment or the excitability. And um, so we can see that sleep and local sleep-like states also alter effective connectivity. And this is um, the, the results I was mentioning from Marcello Massimini. Um, but in addition, in the case of a stroke, um, they've seen that in the perilesional area around the stroke, you see sleep-like activity um, induced essentially by that focal injury. In addition, we can see that local sleep interferes with cognition. And so intracranially, um, this was measured from Yuval Nir and Yitzhak Fried, in 
patients prepped for surgery with implanted electrodes that if you sleep deprive them, um, first of all, they do poorly on cognitive tests when they're sleep deprived, just as we all do. But what they were able to see is that when they were doing badly on a cognitive performance test, it coincided with the generation of local sleep within their brains. And this was able, they were able to measure um, during the course of those experiments. So there really was a strong relationship between the performance and the incidence of local sleep. So cognitive lapses coinciding with local increased propensity for local sleep. And just recently, a paper came out uh, showing that the lapses of attention, so with mind wandering and mind blanking, you get increased incidences of local sleep across the brain um, in, the, in those contexts. So just if, if you're tired, if your mind is wandering, if you're daydreaming, if your mind is blanking, basically there's increased incidence of local sleep and changes then in attention with those incidences. So interestingly, sleep deprivation, so if you're not able to kind of restore this, this excitability balance, um, or with sleep deprivation, you see an increased excitability, you see metabolic stress, you see microglial activation, um, and immune response with chronic sleep disruption. So the proposal here is that that could happen even at a local level. Just as we see local sleep, you could have local increased excitability, you could have local um, microglial activation and, lo and, and putatively um, local neuroinflammatory responses. So one of the things we want to do is, is to see how can we start to get at this in the clinic? How can we start to measure um, sleep and alterations in sleep architecture and, um, and disruptions in sleep? Because it is such an informative uh, process that links directly to the underlying excitability of brain circuitry. And so there is this work um, using combined heart rate and wrist movements from actigraphy devices, such as your smartwatch on your, on your wrist, that can be transformed into a, a sleep architecture that has been validated against polysonography. And so that's one way of kind of getting proxy measures for sleep and sleep architecture. And of course, you know, the opportunity is to, is to integrate data that we learn is meaningful to understanding these homeostatic processes and to understanding sleep and sleep deprivation and excitability, um, for, as well as the genetic background and, and demographics, social interactions and so on, to, to inform um, machine learning models that can help us predict for individuals um, how well you know, can, can we treat them, how, what, what are some optimal interventions, how can we improve their trajectory through care. And so this is some of the proposed things that we could add. I think you're gonna learn a lot more throughout the course of this week in terms of specific potential markers and biomarkers and tests and so on. But the idea is that those should have an integration into the clinician and ultimately patient's decision support dashboard. So they get data, they get information that is helpful to improve care. So I, re I really want to, to thank the, the team at the Kremble Center and um, uh, tre tremendous thanks also to our, our funders, our supporters, and, and thank you all for paying attention and uh, hopefully not too much local sleep out there, but I'd love to see if we have any time for questions. So we have some questions that made it into the question box. Okay. Uh, the first one that, that's been asked a couple times is whether or not we can make slides available. Yes, I think that's that's a core principle for us. So. Yes. So I will be following up with you, uh, and then those slides will be linked uh, to the to the GitHub repo. Great. When we have the one. Okay. 
And do you have the questions in front of you? Let's see, ask a question. Okay. Here we are. What tool would you suggest to design these complex multi-scale models? Great. So we've had some we've had some answers already. This is yeah. great. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a number of different type you know pipelines and tool sets for different types of models. It really depends on um, you know what, where your specific area of focus is and what your specific needs are. But um, the Allen Institute, the Blue Brain Project. Uh, human brain project, eBrains, there are made a, a, quite a lot of tools publicly available um, to support that. And so I certainly encourage you. And then, of course, INCF uh, has some resource pages that can guide you through available tools. So the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, incf.org, um, has some resources as well. Okay. And the next question, as I see it, is, is when extracellular calcium is increased, some difference was observed. If we increase the similar positive charge intracellularly, can we nullify the changes in excitability? Does the question make sense? The question makes sense. I think it's a great question. Um, the, the, the extracellular calcium, what it's doing, is it's actually changing the release probability um, of vesicles from the presynaptic site in, in the synapses. And so you can, to some extent, kind of nullify the changes by hyperpolarizing the cell, but it's not going to be exactly the same. Um, you would have to cancel out essentially that increased propensity. So in the parameter search space, I showed that there is some relationship, right? There is kind of a diagonal along that search space where changes in depolarization do sort of correspond to some degree in changes in calcium, but it's not exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, so it's a little bit more complex than that. Other questions? I don't see any other questions. Do you see any more, Aaron? You're on mute. I don't see any more related to this talk, but uh, I'm going to put up a Gather Town link so you can go chat the Gather Town if you're afraid to ask in. If you're afraid to ask in the chat, you can also you can also actually go approach some of our speakers about um, with your questions, kind of like showing up in front of the, the coffee machine to, to, ask, to come ask them a question with your video on. Um, and that that will not be recorded if anyone feels um, awkward about being in this space. Uh, we also want to remind everyone that these sessions are recorded. This slide will be will be available uh, to return to if you ended up missing the beginning of the session because of um, audio issues. And uh, I think, oh, and we also want to say that a lot of these questions and answers will be posted also to the GitHub discussions board um, for a repo as well. Uh, so of that, I, I think we have to thank Sean Hill for coming and, and bring us into the break. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And have a great, have a great course, everybody. Thank you. Cool. Someone gonna beat me to putting up the gather down link? Let's find it. Okay. Yeah.